president in an interview with NBC correspondent Ray Shearer for an NBC special entitled JFK Report No. 2, videotaped from the cabinet room of the White House on March 23, 1961, for showing over the NBC facilities on April 11, 1961. Mr. President, our notion in coming here is that while the members of your cabinet have become well-known, almost uh, extravagantly well-known the last three or four months, the men who help you run the executive branch of the government, the thinkers and the doers and the persuaders around the White House are perhaps not so well-known. So we've come to you for illumination. Suppose we start with Mr. Sorensen. Well, uh, Ted Sorensen is the uh, counsel for the uh, White House and uh, fulfilled the uh, same... Uh, sort of responsibility when I was a member of the Senate. He's been with me now for eight years. He comes from Nebraska, was the first man in his class at the law school, and has been invaluable. All the messages we send up go through him, and he has the responsibility for the final preparation, uh, from the White House point of view, of all of our legisl domestic legislative programs. I once heard somebody say that when Mr. Kennedy uh, wounded, Sorensen bleeds. Is that so? <laughs> well, we've been very close, and he's been extremely... Uh, active in the uh, many months and years in which I was involved, I suppose, from a long-range point of view from the, from the, uh, in the, for the race, for where, the presidency. Where did, where did you find Ted Sorensen? He worked uh, for Paul Douglas, brought him to my attention, Senator Douglas, because he did some work for Senator Douglas after he came east from Nebraska. He now has a uh, Massachusetts accent. <laughs> Is he the oldest hand on your staff? Well, no, he's one of the, well, he's 32 or 3. So I suppose he's younger, but most of them are younger men. Now, here we have him presiding over a meeting. What, what would that be? Well, this uh, meeting uh, was the, uh, from looking at the faces around, I see uh, Mr. Udall. I would say probably this was the preparation for the uh, message on national resources. And, he then uh, was a... He was here with Secretary Udall, Alma Stotts from the Budget Bureau, Lee White, who works as an assistant to Ted Sorensen, and uh, this meeting was one of a series of meetings that we've held on each of the many messages we've sent dealing with housing, natural resources, agriculture, defense, and all the rest. Ted Sorensen acts as the common denominator to coordinate all those messages. He pulls it together. And it's a tremendously important job because uh, in the final analysis, uh, the kind of program we uh, suggest depends on these sorts of meetings. Now we come to uh, Mike Feldman. Well, Mike Feldman has been with us, was with me in the Senate for five or six years. He had been with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and he was highly recommended at a time when we were looking for another uh, legislative assistant. Mike Feldman w assists Ted Sorensen, and also, uh, for example, he does a number of things. He was the uh, counsel when we were organizing uh, a committee on the distressed areas. He is now uh, the White House representative on a committee to see what we can do to help the textile industry. So that... Uh, as these various responsibilities get pushed onto the White House, we push them on Mike Feldman. Yeah. There's another one of Mike. With Arthur Goldberg, of course, the Secretary of Labor. Do you have a staff that functions as a team, or is it more a series of bilateral relationships that you have? Well, it's a, a, bi it's a combination. It's a wheel and a series of spokes. They all have a uh, relationship because they're all engaged in a common task, but um, I usually, uh, I think probably somewhat differently than some other presidents, We, I work uh, oh, on so. a bilateral arrangement. Well, I think President Eisenhower uh, felt that uh, he could use his time and uh, most effectively by a, having the staff coordinate things at the secondary level and then for him to work through the chairman of the staff. I try to uh, keep in contact with all these men individually because I think that it uh, enables me to keep in much greater intimacy with the various uh, responsibilities we have. Is there anyone else in the White House who knows everything? Does, does it go through one person before it comes to you? All the domestic matters go through Ted Sorensen. All the matters of international security go through McGeorge Bundy. And uh, so I would say that uh, those are the two last. All the matters dealing with my appointments and so on go through Mr. O'Donnell. So I would say those three would probably be but, the... But none of these men are, are Sherman Adams. The fields. No. In, in, that, in that concept. Now, who's this? That's, this uh, is Secretary Rusk with Dick Goodwin. Dick Goodwin came with us about three years ago. He was Felix Frankfurter's law clerk. He had a he? brilliant record at uh, Harvard Law School and has been working as an assistant, and he's been particularly concerned with uh, Latin America 
which has been a matter of special interest to us. And therefore, our program on Latin America and its implementation now have fallen into uh, Dick Goodwin's hands largely. He does have messages too, doesn't he? He works on the messages, that's right. Here he is conferring on again. Of course, he's there with Secretary Rusk. This uh, is a picture of uh, Chester Bowles, the Undersecretary of State, with McGeorge Bundy. Bundy was uh, the dean of uh, Harvard, and I knew him there. But a Yale man originally. But a Yale man, that's right. He, uh, and then he did also did the life of uh, biography of Stimson mm -hmm. and uh, had a uh, brilliant academic record when he was at uh, New Haven. He uh, now uh, has uh, my assistant on national security matters, relations with state, the Defense Department, and all of the responsibilities we now have. On every meeting that we have of those who are dealing with problems such as layoffs, uh, Mr. Bundy is there. He then follows for me uh, the implementation of our decisions here so that we don't decide something and then have it fall between departments. I'm amazed at looking at your appointment list, the number of meetings that he, that he attends in your office. He That's seems correct. to be in on everything that involves security That's or, correct. He does. or diplomacy. He does. Another picture of him here with the Paul Nitze, Assistant Secretary of State for International Security, and Alan Dulles, head of the CIA. This is uh, Walt Rostow. He was a professor at MIT on, and has specialized in his academic career on the problems of economic growth, particularly of the underdeveloped world. He's assistant to McGeorge Bundy and concerns himself with his longtime interest, which is the great, one of the great problems before the United States in the next 10 years, whether these countries to the south of us can make their way economically. But he also concerns himself with the spectrum of uh, national security matters. How did uh, Mr. Mr. Rostow first come to your attention? Well, I uh, organized a committee uh, in uh, Massachusetts of uh, academicians and those with special talents in international problems, national security, housing, and all the rest. And he served on that committee and was a great help to me And before I came here. And I asked him to come and help some more. He, he then works rather closely, I would guess, with Mr. Bundy. He's, yes, he's uh, Mr. Bundy's assistant. And, and, uh, that's also another shot of... Uh, that's Mr. Rostow with members of the Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff. This is... Uh, that's your scientist. That's right. He was a member of uh, President Eisenhower's Scientific Advisory Committee. Uh, he's a uh, was a professor at MIT and particularly uh, was a specialist in communications, but has covered a whole wide range. He's particularly active on disarmament, but has a wide spectrum of uh, information on all of the scientific problems. We, uh, I got to know uh, Professor Wiesner when, uh, because uh, I was interested in uh, nuclear test cessation and disarmament two or three years ago and met him through that, and since that time I've maintained contact with him. And he was one of the men that the previous chairman, Mr. Kisiakowski, who was President Eisenhower's scientific advisor, he also joined in recommending Mr. Wiesner. Well, now, uh, did he have a good deal to do with framing the policies that uh, we've laid out in Geneva? He was uh, uh, one of the Mr. consultants. Uh, actually, uh, he helped organize with Mr. McCloy a committee under Dr. Fisk, who's at the Bell Laboratory, who got a group of scientists to go over our previous positions and set out any new ones which scientific advances might uh, make necessary. Mr. Wiesner, uh, when we are talking about whether we should go ahead with the certain uh, probes into outer space, mm -hmm. what we could do to improve dis desalinization, whether we get fr getting fresh water from salt water, what we should do about the various programs the Defense Department recommends, I talked to Mr. Wiesner, who organizes scientific panels who give us their scientific opinion. The trouble, one of the problems we have in the White House is that there are a number of, there are important and able and dedicated Americans who believe we should carry out, for example, the high nuclear physics uh, work being done at Stanford, but it costs a good deal of money, or that they feel we should put more money into basic research through the National Science Foundation, or they feel we should uh, finance certain uh, efforts in outer space. He acts as a scientific advisor in giving me his judgment and the scientists who we have collected who are among the best in the country, what their opinion is of where we should put the available funds. You think the time will come when you'll have a scientific man in the cabinet itself? Raise it to that rank? Well, it really amounts to that uh, Already. Uh, now in, in a, uh, because he fulfills the function that a scientific advisor. 
We do have an advisory committee composed of representatives of every cabinet officer on scientific matters, but it's getting more and more important and more and more expensive. It certainly is. You might agree to a program this year, which uh, over a period of seven or eight years will vastly uh, involve tremendous sums of money. We've already spent, for example, about uh, eight or nine hundred million dollars in the development of the B-70 airplane. Should we have done it? Well, it's a scientific judgment. That sort of thing, uh, Mr. Wiesner. Well, we know what he did. There's another one, Mr. Wiesner. And now, Mr. Neustadt. Mr. Neustadt uh, is an uh, expert on... Uh, governmental reorganization and has been working for me. He teaches, he's been a professor at Columbia and uh, he was uh, worked at the White House during the days of President Truman. He's written a very uh, uh, significant book on the problems of the presidency and the what, use of presidential power. May I ask you about that? What role did, does, did your reading of his book play in your, the way you run the White House, your concept of, of the presidency? Well, I, I think that uh, the... Uh, the, uh, I think that from a whole variety of uh, previous experiences, uh, it has uh, seemed to me that the, the president has many functions. One of his functions, however, is to uh, try to gather together as many able people as can be gathered and then to constantly stimulate them uh, to uh, action mm -hmm. and use the White House uh, for that purpose. Professor uh, Wiesner's book uh, relates some of the occasions when... Uh, Newstad's book uh, relates some of the occasions when presidents have used their power mm -hmm. and some when they've left their power in vacuum and uh, what has been the effect on the national interest by both of the, on both of those occasions. He's very modest about his book, but I take it that it did illuminate some, some new things for you. Well, I think it's a, it's, it's a good... Uh, now, here we have uh, Arthur's, another Harvard man, Arthur Schlesinger. That's right. He, uh, Professor uh, Schlesinger, was uh, I've known for a great many years. He was, of course, the biographer of Franklin Roosevelt and uh, Andrew Jackson and others. He has been working since he came to the White House, particularly on Latin America. He has uh, made a trip through Latin America, three weeks, made a report, and has been working on a uh, documentation of uh, some of the problems that we faced with in the matter of Cuba, which... We will hope to uh, provide. Uh, Is he kind some of a special projects man, and that Latin America happens to be his preoccupation at the moment? He'll move That's on correct. to something else. That's correct. But Latin America is uh, a great preoccupation of all of us now, and therefore he's devoted his time to that. Arthur is a thinker and a creator. That's right, and uh, I think that uh, Latin America is in the, a most critical period in its relation with us, and therefore if we don't move now, uh, Mr. Castro may become the of a greater danger than he is today. Uh, here we come to, I think, one of the most interesting men on your, in your family, Larry O'Brien. Mr. O'Brien is a, uh, has been working with me for a great many years, became active in my campaign for the Senate in 1952. He's in charge of our liaison with the Congress. When we have all these close votes in Congress, feed, grain, unemployment, Larry O'Brien loses a little more hair. <laughs> he doesn't have much more to lose. <laughs> Where did you say you found him? In 52? 1952. Oh. He had been working for another congressman from Massachusetts and was going back to go into business, but he came and worked with me in organizing our Senate Do campaign. you think he'll be bald by the middle of August? Well, well some of us, oh, he, he will be or I will be. <laughs> Here he is with Senator Smith of Massachusetts, who is my successor. Ralph Dungan. Now, what's he do? Ralph Dungan has been in charge of uh, personnel through the uh, government, securing it and uh, making sure we get his the people we should for positions. In addition, now, he works uh, in sort of a liaison with defense and state, make sure that I see all the messages that come in and uh, that my memorandums to them get back. Did he work with uh, Sergeant Shriver in this big recruiting program? That's that correct, he did, and he November. continued. Uh, he's been doing it since then. And still has it. That's right, though the job is just about finished now. Another shot of Ralph. Kenny Ralph O'Donnell. Kenny O'Donnell. He is an uh, appointment uh, secretary and uh, has, was my assistant uh, for a year during the campaign and worked as my brother's assistant on the rackets committee. And he uh, is in charge of uh, keeping uh, the, the doa. I take it being a Harvard, was he a Harvard quarterback? or half He was half captain of the football team up there. We pretty won't... good training for keeping your door uh, swinging all day long. Yes, he... Uh, what, did he work for your brother before he worked for That's you? That's right, he worked in the rackets committee. Mention that. There's another shot. Now we'd like to have you tell us what uh, Mr. Dutton does. 
Mr. Dutton was Governor Brown's assistant. I came to know him during the last uh, 12 months, and he did an extremely effective job for Governor Brown. He serves as the liaison for all the cabinet positions other than defense and state, and all the agencies of government, and also the governors. We, uh, and he's the cabinet secretary, and uh, so that uh, he is our link with uh, He would pretty m much government. know what goes on in all the departments. That's correct. That's what he's, uh, his responsibility is. How about Mr. Reardon? Mr. Reardon was my administrative assistant for 14 years, and he covers uh, all the matters of concern, whether it may be uh, matters dealing with uh, some of the things we, might, we are trying to do in West Virginia for unemployment, and well, he, uh, follows up every problem. He, that we he have. is the oldest hand, then, I think. That's right. He's been with me from uh, the beginning. Now, this gent here, I happen to know pretty well, Pierre Salinger, but <laughs> I'm going to ask you to talk about him. Pierre Salinger was the press uh, representative, uh, the press man, and uh, an investigator, and a general uh, activities figure on the Rackets Committee, where I first got to know him. He's worked very closely with my brother. Then he came with us and uh, about uh, when we began the campaign. And then he's now taken Mr. Haggerty's job and uh, speaks for the White House. He's out of the cigar. He seems to be smoking more than he used to. <laughs> <laughs> he suddenly goes up in smoke. <laughs> Here's another shot of Pierre presiding over some sort of... Uh, well, the uh, White House uh, is an important uh, center of communications, and therefore his responsibility is great to express, to be responsive to inquiries, and also to present... Uh, what we are trying to do on all the problems which are concerned the American people so that this is a very important job and uh, not merely an automatic one. It has to, needs a good deal of judgment, which I think he showed. And Mr. Andy. Hatcher is his, uh, Andrew Hatcher, who was a newspaper man from San Francisco, is his assistant. Now we come to Walter Heller. Walter Heller, uh, I met uh, when I spoke at uh, the University of Minnesota. And when uh, the time came to see choose a chairman for our Council of Economic Advisors, he was widely recommended by some of the economists that I knew. The job of the Council is to advise the President on the state of the economy and uh, give a prognosis for the future. He is associated with uh, Mr. Gordon, who was with the Ford Foundation, and uh, Mr. Tobin, who was the Sterling Professor at Yale of Economics, and I must say I think they are... Uh, exceptionally uh, what would talented, you? and I think this is a terribly important job. The economy, it, what governmental actions uh, should be taken which will affect the economy beneficially, employment, all the growth, all these come to the council, and I'm dependent upon them for their views on what actions we should take. What would you say is the hallmark of his economic philosophy? Growth, the need for growth? He's concerned with growth, as we all are. If we have growth in this country, we'll have full employment. In addition, we'll have all of the resources that we need to maintain our international security, education, and all the rest. Growth is the key to American strength. Now, Dave Bell. Dave Bell is the no man in this administration. What do you mean? Well, the uh, director of the budget is the president's uh, right arm. Every uh, program which is submitted, and every Washington is filled with... Uh, dedicated men and women who feel that the government funds should be spent for one purpose or another. And Defense Department, State Department, Agriculture, Labor, Education, HEW, and all the rest. And they make their recommendations with vigor. And they come and ask for presidential endorsements, and so do members of the Congress. The Bureau of the Budget has five or six hundred people whose job it is to go through every department and see that the money requests are justified in view of the total demands that we have upon our resources. Mm -hmm. And he has to say no, because uh, if everyone said yes, uh, this country would not be, would be the in bad, bad shape. The deficit would be even bigger than it is. Yeah, that's right. So uh, Dave Bell, I had known uh, Dave Bell before. He had worked you in had Pakistan. Known him? That's right. He came, he was recommended to me by Clark Clifford, mm. who was our uh, chief representative during the uh, transition. He had uh, been out, uh, he was secretary to the School of Public Administration up at Harvard and uh, had worked for President Truman for a period, worked out of Pakistan, and, and I must say is, we've been fortunate to have him. Mr. President, these men all work in one way or another with the cabinet, and I've noticed that you don't seem to have as many cabinet meetings as, as other presidents. Do you find okay. the cabinet unwieldy, or is it just a... Well, actually, I think we've only had uh, two cabinet meetings since uh, 
I've taken over, which is entirely different from previous presidents. But the reason is that all these problems that cabinet officers deal with are very specialized. I see all the cabinet officers every week, but we don't have a general meeting. It really isn't much use in spending a morning talking about the post office budget and tying up uh, Secretary Freeman, who has agricultural responsibilities, or Secretary Ribicoff, who's dealing with the problems of uh, health and education and welfare. It's much better if we have a problem involving labor management for me to meet with Secretary Hodges from Commerce and Secretary Goldberg from Labor and myself so that we meet, uh, we see the cabinet every week, but we do not have these general cabinet meetings, which I really feel to be uh, unnecessary and involve a, a waste of time in many cases. Is the same thing true of meetings of the National Security Council? To a lesser degree, that's also true. We meet, uh, we've averaged three or four meetings a week with the Secretary of Defense and State, George Bundy, and the head of the CIA, Mr. Alan Dulles, and the Vice President. But formal meetings of the Security Council, which include a much wider group, uh, are not as effective, and it's more difficult to decide matters involving high national security if there is a wider group present. I, I think that uh, in the future that uh, we will find the Cabinet uh, perhaps more important than it's ever been, but Cabinet meetings not as important. Uh, I read someplace that you encourage creative competition amongst members of your staff. Is that so? And if so, how does it work? Well, not so much uh, the staff, but uh, one of the problems of any president is that his sources of information are limited. Mm -hmm. I sit in the White House, mm -hmm. and uh, what I read in the paper or what I'm, uh, magazines or p other things that I read, a memorandum, and the people I see, that's the sum total of what I hear and learn. So that uh, the more people that uh, I can see or the wider I can exposed to different ideas, the more effective you can be as president. So therefore, it's a mistake to have just one person working on one subject because then uh, you don't get any clash of ideas and therefore have no opportunity for choice. Well, speaking of sources of information, I must say that ours have been very good today. We, we think you're very gracious for making yourself so available. If it isn't entirely irrelevant, may I ask you this? Why did you make yourself so available to us today? Well, I think this is, uh, the White House is a uh, a uh, extremely important uh, center, the responsibilities placed upon the president by the Constitution and by events uh, are great. How we meet those responsibilities, the people who are associated with me in meeting them, and what our relationship is and how we function, it seems to me, goes to the heart of the presidency. And the presidency is an office which, uh, in a sense, is uh, shared in by all the people. So I would say the more we can communicate successfully beyond the White House, and the more we can pick back, coming back to us, it seems to me, the more effectively this office will be administered. So that uh, everybody has a piece of the White House, and everybody's uh, lives and security are affected by the judgments which are made inevitably here. And uh, I think that everybody ought to know as much about it as possible, and uh, that we ought to know as much about what they're thinking as possible. At which point I will say, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Sir.